sunny day in London, so far away from the Himalayas, which we are speaking <laughs> of. But I can tell you that in those distant peaks, the tallest, youngest mountains in the world, it's getting as hot as it is here. <laughs> the glaciers are melting, it's uh, bad temperatures in the daytime. So we feel completely at home here. Uh, I just, before I introduce the panelists and the session as such, I want to know which of you has any connection with the Himalayas, who's been there, who knows it. I just saw Louise walk in. Yeah, because I thought many of the people in the audience would indeed have some special interest or else an interest in going there sometime in the future. Uh, I just want to give you a little background about the very assorted panel here. Um, <coughs> we have Prajwal Parajuli, who is the author of The Gurkha's Daughter and of Land Where I Flee. And both these books made a very uh, deep impact because they looked from the inside at a part of the world that was more used to being looked at in English from the outside. And uh, he is uh, connected to Nepal and Sikkim and the rest of the mountain ranges there. Janice, next to him, is the author of Boats on Land, a collection of short stories and of Seahorse, a novel. And her new book is The Nine Chambered Heart, which is being translated into several international languages and has done very well. Now, she is a mainstream novelist, but apart from being a mainstream novelist, she is in her some recesses of her identity. Uh, a, a girl from Meghalaya. And uh, I remember when in the Jaipur festival we had Meghalaya Day, the chief minister wanted her as the emblem of uh, the state. <laughs> and, um, and Andrew Duff here, he's uh, traveled the Himalayas across Pakistan, India, Nepal, Tibet. He's written for newspapers around the world, the Times, the Financial Times, Sunday Telegraph, and also Indian papers. But his book, Sikkim, Rikim for a Himalayan Kingdom, is a beautiful, deep, politically incisive study, but also a very romantic story of the king who was uh, dethroned mm. by the Indian state. And when he did a session in Jaipur, it, it threw up some um, deep questions. So, of, and we have then Emma Slade, and Emma has joined us here. She is a Buddhist nun, ordained in the Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan, or in the young democracy of Bhutan. And her journey from a high-flying banker to a Buddhist nun is detailed in her book, which is called Set Free. So, Emma, uh, I, I met Emma for the first time in the Bhutan Literature Festival, where she was speaking there last mm -hmm. year. Um, my own connection with the mountains is that I am from a state called Uttarakhand um, in uh, the central Himalayas, uh, Indian sort of state. And I can see two of my very dear friends, Louise and Salman, also spend time. They have a house there. And um, I've done two anthologies on the Himalayas. One is called The Himalaya. It's just come out from Shambhala in an international edition mm -hmm. and it's around there and in the bookstore. And the other one is called uh, The Himalayan Arc East of Southeast. And in that book, um, we have a wonderful essay from these three. And for the next edition, we hope to have something from Emma, too. Uh, the, the, what I'm trying to look at in this session is the continuities and the very different experiences which have some similarity between them of four people who have written in very different ways about the Himalayas. Um, this bend of the Himalayas includes Nepal, Bhutan, Northeast India, and Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And the book showcases the shared cultural contexts, emphasizing both the indigenous and the migratory identities. The Nepalese, for example, are in, the, in Nepal, but over, uh, they have a footprint which is much larger and uh, chucked out from here and there once in a while. Yeah. And, <laughs> and which manifests in worship, in food, habits, in cuisines, musical traditions, and folklore. So whichever part of the Himalayas in the east of southeast, you know that there's a continuity. 
one of the essays says the real reason is that they all eat momos. <laughs> Killing them. This is, and then we found that Kashmir, which is a Himalayan state, certainly, but which is politically even more troubled than the eastern end of the Himalayas. Uh, I just read that the, a very prominent politician in Kashmir, in the middle of the bloodshed and the huge identity politics and the stone pelting, he started a demand which, which was to ban the Momo. Because he said that the Momo is very dangerous for the health of Kashmiris. <laughs> because it has too much MSG in it. <laughs> so, so here, the, there's also the deeper memory of those animistic traditions of the Bonpo religion and of the shadow of Tibet in which the Eastern Himalayas lie. So even as Tibet has changed, uh, the shadow of it, the impact of the Tibetan culture on all these places remains, I think, as strong as ever and is one of the glues of the identity. And uh, there's the voice of the mountains itself with generations of Hindus and Buddhists, other spiritual practitioners. Uh, we, we do think of the Himalayas as a very spiritual place, which indeed they are to a very large extent. And uh, not only Emma, but the others will also tell you about those. Um, I want to read out just one paragraph, which I read out to this panel in the author's lounge. And some of them agreed and some of them disagreed. But this is what the Himalayas mean to me. I grew up there. And um, I think it's different from other mountains because it gets a huge monsoon. So it gets, uh, there's a damp in the air sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it's from Kipling. And who else but Kipling would we quote for the Himalayas or for anything here in London? <laughs> so he says, the last puff of the day wind brought in from the unseen villages the scent of damp wood smoke hot cakes, dripping undergrowth, and rotting pine cones. That is the true smell of the Himalayas. And if once it creeps into the blood of a man, that man will, at the last, forgetting all else, return to the hills to die. So that is the sort of loyalty to those mountains, which I, I, I go to Bhutan all the time, and I get it. I go to the festival in Boulder, and when I see the Rockies, I say, wow. But, but something, there's a smell of rot that is missing there. <laughs> so for some people, the Himalaya is a frontier against which to test themselves. Others find refuge and tranquility, a place where they can seek themselves, perhaps even God. They are the youngest, tallest mountains in the world, home to ancient civilizations. They reveal as much as they withhold. In this session, we seek to invoke the spirit of the Himalayas, the exhilaration, and yes, the desolation of those rugged mountains, which Yeats described as self-born mockers of man's enterprise. And really, when you see those mountains, uh, I was once on a flight to Bhutan, and there was a very arrogant publisher who shall remain unnamed and is not the publisher of any of you, a very brilliant <laughs> and unnamed publisher. He was sitting next to me and he said, wow, when I see these mountains, I realize how insignificant we humans are. Mm. So I said, you can do it without seeing the Himalayas. <laughs> well, but there is something about the Himalayas that gives you a different perspective. So I'm going to begin here with Prajwal. Prajwal, your essays in this anthology lament the tourist trap that Sikkim has become, and also Darjeeling. Tell us of your relationship with the mountains as a boy growing up in Sikkim, of your Nepali connections. You're a very cosmopolitan person, but you have a deep, deep connection with all those places. You trek endlessly. You complain endlessly about tourism. <laughs> you know, tell us about your travels in the region, how much the state has changed. Would love you to read some of your Lovely. splittingly funny essays and see if they raise a laugh here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Namita. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am from Gangtok, Sikkim, which is a state in the Himalayas. Ha ha. Uh, we, it became a part of India in 1975. Now, depending on who you ask, mm -hmm. we were either annexed by India in 1975 or willingly became a part of India in 1975. To know more about that, read Andy's book. <laughs> but uh, our last queen was an American. Uh, and uh, when I was growing up in Sikkim, it was not the very Swiss, very Porsche state that it's become now. 
The central government has been flushing so much money into Sikkim, which is wonderful. We call it the central government's, the Indian government's guilt money. You know, annex us and then pour as much money as you want and make us all wealthy. But uh, what's happened is because there is a lot of peace in Sikkim, I mean, it might be one of those few places in the Himalayas where there is absolute peace. Tourism has, has grown uncontrollably, you know, you, uh, um, I mean, there may be some problems in the neighboring Darjeeling hills, there's nothing happening in Sikkim, I mean, you know, the problems in the Darjeeling hills do affect us, but uh, when I was growing up, there were cottages in Gangtok, now you'd be lucky if you saw maybe two and a half cottages. And uh, you could see the Kanchanzonga, the third highest uh, uh, peak in the world, from many, many points in Gangtok. Now the buildings have grown so big, I mean, they've expanded horizontally and vertically that you don't really see the Kanchanzonga from your rooftop as you used to, or as I used to when I was growing up. Just to give you a little example, my next door neighbors, uh, constructed a massive seven-storied hotel which blocked the view of the mountain from my parents' rooftop. So, of course, my dad took it upon himself to add two more floors to his building. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and there is a, a teeny-weeny portion up on the terrace, a crow's nest from which you can maybe see a an itsy-bitsy portion of the conscience on Ghana. But, I mean, that thrills them to no end. Now, I'm sort of waiting for the neighbor on the other side to add two <laughs> or three floors to his building so he's not deprived of conscience on their views. Um, I'll read a bit from my essay on Sikkim, which uh, is uh, in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, that's fine. I'll, uh, I have it here. Okay. It's, it's a very short piece, so don't leave your seats just yet. Okay, so uh, this is a, a travel piece. I uh, was in West Sikkim, which is a very, very picturesque part of Sikkim, and uh, here it is. The Chumbi Mountain Retreat in Pelling, West Sikkim, is unlike any other hotel I've been to. Newly built, but with an eye on history, the luxury hotel is almost a tableau to the erstwhile kingdom of Sikkim. Pictures of the last king and his American queen, and the kings and queens before them deck the walls. The lobby and formal dining room, house words, trumpets, and trunks. I'm not staying at the hotel. I know the owners, and I want to avoid the you're our guest, so we can't allow you to pay awkwardness that's <laughs> bound to surface. Besides, on this trip, I'm slumming it. I'm staying at a backpacker's paradise called Kabur. At the Kabur, I pay rupees 500 a night. The most expensive suite at the Chumbi is rupees 36,000. The walls of my room at the Kabur are green with mold. The rooms at the Chumbi look like they've been transplanted from a palace. I've heard rumors that the Chumbi is on the verge of being declared a five-star hotel. It deserves the tag. I've also heard rumors that the Leela, the Indian chain of super luxury hotels, has expressed interest in running the Chumbi. The small town boy in me is ecstatic. <laughs> The well-traveled adult in me is skeptical. This marriage of India with Sikkim, I'm convinced, will create disharmony. But I simply have to look at history to know that the union just might work. Sikkim became a part of India in 1975. Apart from the occasional nostalgia for pre-1975 days, the Sikkimese, by and large, have made peace with the merger, thanks in no small part to the union government pouring enormous amounts of cash into the state. Families that were struggling only a generation ago are extremely wealthy today. Mm. Tourism is booming. Almost every building in the two-kilometer stretch that is downtown Pelling is a hotel, restaurant, or travel agency. 
You want to know more? Buy the book. Uh, Namita is going to sign it. So you go. Thank you. I just wish we had got him to read the piece about being in Darjeeling, maybe yeah. another time. <laughs> that was a hysterically funny piece <laughs> about uh, Bengali tourism. Oh. <laughs> but Any Bengalis in the audience? Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Lovely. <laughs> because the Bengali tourists in the Himalayas are known for the fact that anybody from Bengal feels about 10 times as cold as the rest of the world. <laughs> So on a day like this, we would know a Bengali because they'd be wearing a balaclava hat. Oh, yeah, of course. And, <laughs> and maybe mittens or something like that. Monkey caps. Yeah. Monkey caps. Yeah. yeah, monkey caps, exactly. So all across the Himalayas, you have the monkey caps yeah. and the good people inside them. <laughs> so I'm going to move to Emma. Um, Emma, yours is an amazing story of being a very successful banker, and then a series of situations, circumstances, accidents, turning you into a Buddhist nun, one of the few Western nuns to be ordained in Bhutan. The only one. Uh, do you have any special connection with the Himalayas before your initiation? How has Bhutan itself, with its beauty and spirituality, inspired your Buddhist practice? What have you learned from the Himalayas? And all this is the good stuff. But also, I, I understand that in Buddhist practice in large parts of the Himalayas, there, nuns are discriminated against at uh, various levels in the faith. And there is a struggle to bring in a little gender perspective. Because I'm told that as a Buddhist nun, you cannot get nirvana, redemption, or whatever, unless you're born with a you-know-what. You better watch me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about okay, all yeah. that also. That all right, know. I think I have one slide here just to start the session. You can rest your eyes on that. Um, first of all, I'm looking forward to anybody's questions. If we get time at the end, I really enjoy questions. And homage indeed to the uh, beautiful word of Tibet. Uh, homage to all Tibetan culture and the Tibetan language and the Tibetan people, which, as you so rightly said, have had such a huge influence uh, Tibet had many little wars, in fact, with Bhutan, uh, but has had a huge influence on uh, the country. And without their preservation of the Tibetan inquiry into the nature of mind, we would all be, uh, have less in our culture today. So I just wanted to start my talk with this Mani wall, Om Mani Pemi Hong, the uh, mantra of compassion which arises, in fact, from Sanskrit, from Indian heritage, as well as the link to Tibet. This is the... Um, these are the sacred syllables which express uh, the wish for us all to, to realize our capacity to become compassionate to others without limit. This is this... Mantra, and for me, it is the, um, it's very crucial in the start of my Buddhist journey. But it was really this mantra within uh, Bhutan, which had such a uh, big role in uh, waking up my heart and eventually you know, writing the book and also founding a charity for special needs children in Bhutan. Uh, Bhutan has had a hugely transformative effect on my life because it showed me my purpose. It showed me my own potential meaning. I feel it showed me how to spend my time. And so I'm forever grateful to it. Uh, in fact, I'm flying there this evening and already the clear skies of Bhutan, no much, not so much the damp yes. food, but the clear skies of Bhutan, which, you know, this clarity, this quality of clarity which we associate with the mind in meditation practice. You know, already it's coming to me now, and the terrifying flight into Paro, uh, <laughs> if you've done it, into Paro, and the, 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 uh, uh, the plane banks, and you feel very close to trees. And so just arriving in Bhutan is in itself a religious experience. You're so pleased you managed to get there in one piece, <laughs> isn't it, Amita? Indeed. Yes, indeed. So. Um, Obviously, having been raised in the West, the notion of compassion and a limitlessly compassionate mind, it didn't really come up a lot in my education. It certainly didn't come up a lot in my career. 
but as a result of being held hostage uh, in 1997, I had a glimpse into the, my own potential for compassion. But how to make that become real, I didn't really know how to do in the West. I made some progress, but it was really physically being in the Himalayas, being in a country where the mantra of compassion is everywhere. That really gave me the confidence to say, this is my path. You know, the, the path towards compassion is my path. And that is what I've pursued ever since. Um, I am the only Western woman ordained in Bhutan. It's a huge honor, and I feel it's a responsibility. Because to have faith in me, to be a good practitioner, it, um, you know, it's something I must live up to, some expectations I must live up to. And if I am going to forge a path to encourage other women, then of course I have to behave very well. <laughs> Ultimately, the, uh, the nature of mind is non-gendered and non-dual. But in the beginning, we will hang on to conventional duality. Mm. All humans will, yeah. Uh, but when we look at the practices and the texts, the goal is to realize your non-dual mind Sometimes I am made very aware of the gender that I have, that I am in a female form. Although often actually in India they think I'm a man because I'm very tall and I often get called sir, which is an interesting, interesting experience. A lot of people will ask me to think of my gender and define myself as a result of my gender. But I'm not sure I'm going to comply, really. And so I carry on with the attitude of somebody who is looking to realize the non-dual nature of their mind. I am taught by my Lama and my Kempos in Bhutan. I have an extraordinary opportunity to train with them. And the opportunity to train with them in the Himalayas, in that clear sky, uh, you can see it's such a special chance. And uh, I'm really taking it with all my best uh, energy, you can say. Wonderful. So I look forward to your questions if yes. we have time. Certainly, I'm sure there'll be many questions for you. No, I was not asking you a gendered question. No. I was, I was, we had done some sessions in Bhutan on, on the nuns and all that. Maybe I'll ask you a question afterwards in the author's lounge. But thank you for that beautiful glimpse into the the spiritual beauty of the Himalayas. And now we move to other realities. We come to Andrew, whose piece in my anthology, The Himalayan Arc, East to Southeast, draws from his fascinating book, Sikkim, Rikim for a Himalayan Kingdom. So please, Andrew, tell us your travels through the Himalayas. What drew you to the very romantic story of the last Chogyal of Sikkim and his American wife, Hope Cook? And uh, the way you have told the story, we would love you to read a paragraph or two, to, if you felt like it, to, to give the audience a feeling of this great kingdom. Thank you. Former yeah. king. Former, former king. king. Yeah. No. Exactly. Well, we are looking yeah. in the past. <laughs> we have a former foreign minister of India sitting in the audience, and I can feel him saying, um, thinking in his political mind about this question. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, I, I, I first traveled in the Himalayas in the Karakoram in probably my early 20s and sort of bumped up against the hill stations north of Delhi a few times. But there was one place that had actually sort of lived in my head since my childhood, which was Sikkim. And it lived in my head as a very much a black and white images of this place because my grandfather had traveled there in the 1920s uh, when he'd been stationed in Calcutta. And he'd been on this 120-mile walk into Sikkim from Darjeeling. Um, so these images were just wonderful and, and he had some notes as well there about this trek and I, I just looked at them sort of for 30 years in truth, for 30 years I was looking at these photographs and then in 2008 I decided to go and um, follow the, his footsteps. So in, in that sense uh, I, I, I wasn't particularly drawn to the story of the Chogul and Hope Cook because I didn't even know who they were when I first went into Sikkim. Um, and I, I had the great privilege of walking into Sikkim uh, and walking out of Sikkim for the first time. So, so I'd, I'd spent two weeks in Sikkim without ever stepping inside a vehicle, which, was, which I think is a, a, a really interesting way to travel. 
And um, at the apex of the, 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 this trek, this 120 mile trek, uh, there was a hilltop monastery and I, I started chatting to the, the, the monk in there and he was sort of saying, well, how much do you actually know about Sikkim? And I really knew very little. Um, and it transpired that he had actually been uh, a former soldier and he'd been the, the right-hand man to the, the king, to the, the, the head of the king's guard at the time of the annexation, I think uh, Namati sort of alluded to it, this, this moment in 1975 when just on the eve of the declaring an emergency across India, Indira Gandhi just quietly snaffled up the, uh, the kingdom of Sikkim into the Indian state. And as Prajwal says, it's been a, you know, since then there's been a, a lot of money gone into Sikkim. It's a very peaceful place. Uh, but I was, got very, very interested about this kind of event around 1975 and what happened, what the background was to that. So, uh, and and this, this monk, this former, the former king of the, the former uh, head of the Sikkim guard, he had this great mix of sort of fierce loyalty to this last king who had been thrust into a role which he hadn't expected. His, elder brother had been killed in the Second World War, so he, he'd never expected to be king, and he became king of this tiny Himalayan state, it's only 40 miles by 60 miles, and, uh, and then, uh, but the, uh, so, so fierce loyalty, but also tinged with sadness. So that, that was kind of my first sort of uh, thing that I, it got me interested in this, in this, in this story. Um, but, but it was still very hazy as a story, and when I got back to the UK, I managed to find two teachers uh, Scottish teachers who had taught at one of the schools in, in, in Gangtok, in the main capital, and, and I went to see them, and, and they had both written letters home every week from Sikkim while they were there during the 60s and 70s, and this was the kind of crucial period in Sikkim after Hope Cook had arrived in Sikkim. So suddenly this place kind of burst into Technicolor. Um, Hope Cook was in, featured in the Parry Match, in Time magazine, National Geographic. She was known as Grace Kelly of the East. Uh, she and the king were holding fashion shows in New York. They were really, it was an amazing kind of story of what, what they tried to do with Sikkim in terms of trying to sort of promote the place. Um, and, and they also had this sort of first-hand perspective on the story. So it's a, Sikkim's a story that's often told in retrospect and it's told by people seeking to justify a point of view. And if you've got people writing letters home every week, it's like a historian's dream because they've got no agenda. They're just writing what they see. Um, and, and so I was able to include a lot of that material in the book. And, and as I started to go back and back to Sikkim, uh, it got further and further under the layers of this story. And it is a complex story. And the shadow of Tibet uh, is, is very important because the, uh, the ruling family, the Namgyals, had emigrated out of uh, Tibet in the, in the middle of the 17th century. And so that was, there was this sort of, it's a, Sikkim is on the kind of, if you look at a, a, a map of the Himalayas, if you look at a, a satellite photography map of the Himalayas, you'll see a tiny chink, and that's Sikkim. Uh, so it was a, this sort of access point through to, the, through to, the, uh, through to Tibet for the British and, and uh, before that, the, 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 the Indian traders and the Nepali traders, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, um, so I started to get under the skin of this story. And, and I suppose that the, the, the thing that really kind of almost like pulled it all together was, was uh, when I was just I'd finished kind of writing the first draft of the book. And you, remember, you might remember WikiLeaks released a lot of documents between Washington and Delhi and, and Beijing. And uh, so I just innocently, I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just do a quick search for the word Sikkim and see, see what happens. You know, WikiLeaks put a very helpful uh, search facility on the front. And up came 1,500 cables, 1,500 cables uh, mentioning Sikkim. So, and these were things that were incredibly uh, sort of intimate as well. So, you know, you had uh, Henry Kissinger and Zhu Enlai, the, the, the Chinese premier, uh, talking about how oh, I can't stand that Hope Cook. She used to fiddle with her prayer beads the whole time. You know, that sort of level of intimacy in terms of this, this story. But more importantly, you kind of understood how far the Cold War really kind of played out in Asia. Uh, and you had this four-way dynamic between India and China and Russia and the USA and the sort of swirling priorities around the early 70s. So I was able to kind of put that into the, into the book as well. Um, but I, I, and I think, you know, actually, if you stand in the middle of Sikkim, uh, you could go 20 miles um, west and you would change your watch by quarter of an hour because you'd be in Nepal. You could go 20 miles east and you'd change your watch 30 minutes the other way, yeah, because it's uh, Bhutan. You could go 20, 30, I think 30 miles north and you'd be in China and you'd change your watch by two hours because <laughs> China's got the entire um, uh, uh, single, single time zone. So it's this place, it's this kind of meeting place between uh, different 
cultures and different um, attitudes. Uh, and, and everything sort of comes together into Sikkim. And if I, I, that, that's what took me to the, the place and the story and the, and the, the people, really. So. so do you want to read a little bit? Do you have time? To yeah, read? I mean, want to do well, the, the, if, if there's something you want to read. I, I think it's uh, the, the one bit I did, I, I thought would be worth just a very, very short. Um, in 1975, uh, after the, um, the, the, the takeover, the, the, the Indian princes often had a very strong relationship with, with uh, aristocrat, arist, uh, the aristocracy and the, the bureaucracy of, of, of Britain. Um, so during this period when uh, Sikkim was, uh, you know, the, the question of Sikkim's identity was coming up, there were a lot of correspondence between the, the, the last king of Sikkim and some of the, the, the politicians and all the rest of it in the UK. And to the extent that actually the British government was pretty worried when the whole thing happened. And, and Jim Callaghan, who was then the, the foreign secretary, commissioned a report uh, on the takeover of Sikkim. And it's just this, the final paragraph of that report, I think, really brings to life the the way in which uh, Britain had this uh, culpability to a certain extent around what had happened in Sikkim uh, certainly had an influence over what happened in Sikkim. So I'm just going to read that last paragraph. So this was a, a British Foreign Office report which is held in Kew and was released under the 30-year rule in 2006. Um, and it was called the Indian Takeover of Sikkim. And this is the last paragraph. And it says, all in all, the world may be a little worse off for the loss of a Shangri-La ruled benignly but in the interests of a small minority by a Buddhist prince with an American wife and a liking for alcohol. <laughs> the Indian action may seem a little crude, an Indian self-justification somewhat nauseating, but no British interests were involved, no deep moral issues were at stake, and only one life was lost, probably accidentally. In the days of British India, we would have done just the same. <laughs> and frequently did with recalcitrant maharajas, though one may hope a little earlier and with fewer exclamations at our own virtues. In the event, we successfully kept out of the whole business, and such support as the Chogyal has received in the correspondence columns of the Times has not been sufficient to offend Indian sensitivities. Oh, wow. <laughs> that is lovely. It's brilliant. So we have uh, also in the audience uh, one of the contributors to the uh, anthology, which is John Elliott. And he talks about his first meeting with the king of Bhutan in 1984. For 84? 88. And, uh, and of course, the Sikkim royalty was deeply, is still deeply related mm -hmm. to Bhutanese royalty. And the kingdom of Bhutan, the young democracy of Bhutan, has managed the transition very, very effectively yeah. and are uh, revered uh, the only remaining uh, much-loved uh, royal family in the region now, yeah. as I see it. Um, now we come back to democracy, <laughs> uh, traveling to, of course, I mean, we have democracy in Sikkim, but we come back to Janice and her connections with the mountains. Yes. Janice, you were born in Jorhat in Assam and grew up in Shillong yes. and in tea estates in Assam as well. Yes. Uh, were you ever conscious while growing up of living close to these greatest mountain ranges in the world? <laughs> or were you conscious of being... Uh, somebody's typed this wrong because uh, I, got, I dictated this to somebody and they said, were you conscious of being mountainous? <laughs> so I don't know. Very mountainous. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> But also since you live a very cosmopolitan life now between the UK, between Delhi and Meghalaya, what is your relationship to your home state? Tell us about it, how it impacts your writing, uh, do a little, right. the, the feel of the place. Right. In any of these three or four or whatever uh, right. tropes in which we have looked at it. Right, okay, thank you um, Namita. So usually when people ask me uh, where I'm from, if I'm in the UK and people ask me where I'm from, I say, I'm from a part of India that usually falls off the map. Um, that little bit at the edge that's sort of there but not quite there and we don't really know what it's doing there. Um, so Namita's right, I, I grew up between uh, the tea estates of Assam and the hills of Shillong and um, oddly enough the Himalayas were a part of my uh, childhood in Assam far more than in the mountains of Shillong. 
Um, because in Assam, in the Great Plains, in that valley, you could see them in the distance. Um, so when we'd go for our, there wasn't much to do in 1990s Assam, so it was very Austinian. We'd go for walks in the evenings and take the air. Um, and there they were, at the edges of the tea estates, sort of turning lightly pink in the dusk, or bright and jagged and snowy um, in the mornings. And I remember my parents referring to them as the snows. Oh, we can see the snows today. Oh, we must go and check if, you know, the snows are, are, are sort of clear and present. Um, and I went to boarding school in Assam as well, from where we were taken on very ambitious treks through the mountains of Arunachal, so bordering China, and um, the mountains in West Bengal, beyond Darjeeling. And it was frightening. Um, there we were, these 13-year-olds battling blizzards in Sandakfu. <laughs> God, I don't know what they were thinking. But we managed. We were fine. We trekked. We lived in, you know, these little trekkers' huts. And we, 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 we braved the blizzards. And, you know, we reached viewpoints from where the mountains looked close enough to touch. And it's a sight that I will never forget. Because they are right there there. Um, growing up in, in Shillong, which is far more mountainous than Assam, oddly enough, I think when you're away from the mountains, you think about them more. So being in the mountains and in the hills of Meghalaya, I never quite thought of them very much. They were just there, part of the landscape. I had to climb a hill to come back from school with my heavy bag and, you know, that was annoying. Um, or I could smell pine um, in, the, in the morning air, but it, it sort of just lingered or flickered at the edge of my imagination until um, I started writing. And I had a whole host of these stories that had sort of been swirling in me for many years and I didn't quite know what to do with them. I was living in Delhi, working in Delhi, I'd studied in London, and these stories sort of hadn't quite found a home until I returned for a year to the mountains. And I wrote my first book there called Boats on Land. And they're stories that are deeply, deeply anchored to place, to Cherapunji, the wettest place on earth, to Shillong, this curious little hill station town created by the British. Um, to Assam, the wildness um, and vastness of Assam. Um, and I thought perhaps um, I could read a little excerpt from one of my stories from Boats on Land. It's a story that actually looks at how troubled and beautiful Shillong has been. Um, like with a lot of the other places in the Northeast, Shillong has seen massive political sort of turbulence. Meghalaya was once part of Assam and then it was carved out of Assam in 1972. It became its own state. Everyone in the hills wanted to throw out everyone who was not from the hills and it was crazy. Um, but here's a little excerpt from a story called Embassy. It was a corpse cold evening in mid-December when Josephine broke his heart. The sky was the color of razor blades lying flat and square outside the window and slivered delicately between the branches of bare trees. The air both numbed and sharpened his senses, froze and shaped his breath. In his ears was the echo of her silence when he asked about Ashley the Anglo boy from the neighborhood next to theirs, the boy with the blue-gray eyes who played the guitar just like Slash. I saw you with him last week and yesterday. Just tell me the truth, Joe. And in her own way, he supposed she had. Just tell me the truth, he pleaded. I don't know, she snapped at one point. What truth? Whose truth? It was very simple, he said. Did she want to be with Ashley or with him? And when she kept quiet, he knew. So he walked aimlessly for a while, pacing the sloping streets of his locality until he reached the bustle of Laimukra. These are all little places in Shillong. And he's walking around, 
looking for a drink. Um, the pavements were crowded with evening shoppers and local vegetable sellers stocked with sheaves of mustard leaves. And after he navigated Jacob's Ladder, a long flight of narrow, slippery stairs that led to the bottom of Don Bosco Hill, he walked briskly by Ward's Lake and the main post office building. Eventually, he strode down the sloping Sosotham Road towards Kindai Lat, a pulsing heart of people and traffic. From here, spreading out in long, grasping fingers, were seedy, unlit streets. Bishesh, the chisel-faced Nepali chap at the counter of the bar called Embassy, nodded as he walked in. Everyone knew Bishesh only spoke to regulars. Most of the time, he behaved as though he owned this place. He didn't. Some Marwari man did, but he wasn't usually at the bar. Shillong was safe now for outsiders to own businesses, but not that safe. Merely 20 years ago, streets rang with the cries of Bedakhar, throw away the outsiders. Memories in cases like these were long and warily forgiving. It was best to keep behind the scenes like an elusive puppeteer. Hence, if Embassy had changed hands a hundred times from one Dakar to another, nobody inside knew. Most were in no state to care. They looked around over the crowds of heads and for a moment his intention wavered. He'd come for a drink, but there wasn't a single table free. He stood undecided for a moment. He didn't know if he could go to another place. All the other bars were quite expensive and all the cheap alcohol joints near his neighborhood in Limokra had been closed by the order of the Senkinthe, the women's groups, a local women's organization aiming to eliminate vice and immorality in town. Damn them, he cursed silently. There was always the option, he supposed, of buying a bottle, drinking it on the sidewalk like so many others did. Then again, there was the danger of someone he knew walking by. The drinkers, though, were in an amiable mood tonight, and more than that, could recognize a thirsting, despairing soul. Hey, bro, they beckoned. Join us. Hey, Shonghangne, sit here. And from a dark corner, a single word, Thais Kem, someone who knew his name. From that distance, they couldn't make out the man's face. It might have been anyone, yet as he approached the table, he couldn't place him. It was a face that wasn't uncommon, marked by the singular wariness that settled over everyone's features in a town landlocked by more than towering mountains. Somewhere, the light shifted. A shadow moved, they caught the highlight of his nose, the familiar eyes, and a name snapped into place like a cocked gun. Thank you. I want to, as you will guess, across the Himalayas, we all of us drink a lot. That whatever the time zones, whatever, the, whatever happens, they keep at the ara or the sake or the whatever is the local brew. Yeah. Uh, on that very evocative note, across the Himalayas, thank you all of you. I'm going to open up for questions because I know that there would be many, many questions. Can, there's, a, there's somebody there. If you could tell us your name as well. Um, thank you, my name is Moise. Um, I want to go back to the point that you mentioned at the start where the uh, publisher on the flight said that we are insignificant compared to the mountains, but obviously over time with huge infrastructure projects um, in, in Pakistan uh, through the China-Pakistan corridor or through dam projects in Tibet or just the general effects of climate change, uh, how are the mountains changing and how are people responding to these changes? Yeah, I think that is one of the questions I was in fact also going to ask and I think it's a crucial question. Uh, which I pose to any of you who want to speak of it, perhaps Prajwal or Emma or any of you about the environmental degradation that is happening across from Pakistan all the way um, down the sweep of the Himalayas mm -hmm. and yeah. your personal experiences and apprehensions. Yeah, Namita, until about two weeks ago, I used, I used to feel so smug about the fact that Gangtok was one of those rare hill towns with absolutely no water problem. 
I, I don't know if you guys have been following the news, but Shimla, the water problem in Shimla has apparently become so bad that uh, uh, there's, there's no water in the city at all. Mm. And, uh, you know, I remember telling a few people, oh, Gangtok has never had these problems. But for the first time ever, Gangtok has a water problem this mm. year. I, and uh, we have a mighty river called the Tista that looks like a ghost, you know, that looks more and more like a ghost of itself on every trip I make. It's, it's becoming so much slimmer, so much smaller, it's, it's drying up. But and Is that because of dams or is uh, it because of the rainfall? It, it, it's likely because of the, the hydroelectric power, uh, you know, the crazy uh, exploitation of uh, hydroelectric power that's been going on in Sikkim for a while. So, so that is there. And uh, the other is, uh, I was just in, in Missouri for about uh, a month. And uh, I, I noticed that the, the trash problem in the town, I mean, this is, uh, you know, uh, it may be slightly far removed from uh, the exact issue of mountains that we were discussing, but it's, it's crazy. Even in Landar, which prides itself in being this very untouched uh, cantonment mm -hmm. area, the disposal of trash left a lot to be desired. And uh, what's happening is monkeys are no longer getting enough food in the forest to eat, so they're coming into towns. I, I don't know. Is that Let how it Let me explain was? that. Yeah. We, I'm sure we want to move to the next question. But the <laughs> monkey thing, there's a garbage session going on, India's garbage problem in the next tent, but so sadly we can't go and listen in there. But the monkey problem in the part of the world I come from is unique to India. That there were religious places like Mathura and Brindavan that had what was called the monkey menace. But because monkeys are sacred and we can't really trouble them too much or offend them, so they were sent in bus loads or plane loads to the mountains. Oh my God. So these urban monkeys have yeah. now <laughs> populated it. So they don't know how to yeah. search in the mountains for food, so they scavenge. That's oh, my God. And of course, <laughs> the, the very and other monkey. great issue is the diversion of uh, water from yeah. Tibet um, and from China. But it's a very important question. Question. But I'm sure there are other questions so we won't take forever to answer it. Yeah. Can I make, just make one yes, comment please. on that? So the, 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 the link between the corruption and the, the hydroelectric project, project, certainly in Sikkim, is, is an important one to kind of, kind of recognise. I mean, I think at one stage there were 43 registered projects uh, in Sikkim and no one could find any more than 17. So that's the mm. kind of way that this, this thing works. Mm. Yeah, I think first the question there right next to you, the lady there. And then to you, sir. Namita, not a question, but just a little anecdote I want to tell you. You were talking about the garbage. Uh, when my husband and I uh, called on the, the, the fourth king of uh, Bhutan, uh, while Salman did all the diplomatic stuff, I talked to his wife. And she was very concerned about the whole garbage problem in, uh, in, in, in Bhutan. Uh, plastic all over the place. And they said, we didn't have a, don't have a place to get rid of this. And I suggested to her that since every home has the little patch where they grow asparagus and uh, there's a lot of garbage, the, you know, uh, the kitchen waste, why don't they start a scheme for uh, vermicomposting? I said, make it compulsory. And she asked, how do we go about doing it? So I sent a vermicomposting kit to her. <laughs> when her son came to, uh, to India, I sent a kit to her and I got this very charming uh, uh, return gift, two big packets of uh, Bhutan chilies, a nice carpet, and a lovely little note that said, thank you for the wonderful worms. <laughs> ah, nice. Excuse me. There's a question here. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name's Duncan Bartlett. I'm the editor of Asian Affairs magazine. I very much enjoyed the readings by the panelists. Emma Slade tantalized us with some uh, biographical details about your life, that you'd been a banker and that you'd uh, been held hostage. But you didn't read us any of your writings. I'm wondering whether you might uh, illuminate the mystery and, 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 and also uh, read us a passage that you've written. No, no, there's not time for that. No, no, no. <laughs> well, not the reading, but no, surely no. you can tell us about what he wants to know uh, about well, your being hostage and the biographical details. Uh, well, that's the book. <laughs> um, 
being held hostage <laughs> clarifies the mind. Mm. What context were you held hostage? Well, you have to read the book. I was in Jakarta. <laughs> I was in Jakarta. Mm. I was held hostage in a five-star hotel, so a very nice place to be held hostage. <laughs> you read the book. <laughs> you can buy the book well, in the bookstore and get it signed. Uh, are there any more questions? <laughs> we have time for more questions. Transactional relationship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a question there. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I hoped that some mention in some extended form would have been um, given towards Tibet or the so-called autonomous region of Tibet as the Chinese government terms it, which gives the impression that it is in fact an independent sovereign state, which it is not because the so-called autonomous region of Tibet is now just the central part of the original kingdom of Tibet, the outlying areas have in fact been ceded to the Chinese provinces. And a lot of people are obviously not aware of this. And uh, one, yeah, I did honor one, Tibet. one cannot help feeling a great sense of sympathy yeah. for the Dalai Lama, for mm. the way he's been treated as well. Uh, Emma, would you like to answer that? Yeah, absolutely. I did pay homage to Tibet at the start of my talk and uh, its contribution uh, histor historically and now. Um, you know, Tibet is a sacred place with a sacred language and a huge culture, which is, uh, I think I tried to explain, is in fact now benefiting much of the world. Uh, my heart goes out to the Tibetan people who live uh, as an occupied people. And one of the people, that one of the people who teaches me Tibetan here, because I must study classical Tibetan, and I'm here to tell you it's harder than being celibate, <laughs> lives in London, and he is a Tibetan refugee who walked over the Himalayas, came through Nepal into India, and now is in London. And it's humbling to talk to any Tibetan person, and we should never forget, never forget. Uh, it gives Bhutan a very special place, a very precious place in the world because they are the last remaining unoccupied Vajrayana Buddhist country in the world. And it gives me more determination to uh, honor that uh, lineage, that teaching, um, seeing what has happened on the northern border of Bhutan. Yeah, you're quite right. Thank you for bringing it up. Very nice. Do we have time for more questions? Or? One more question, if there's any. Uh, if you haven't, then I think we are almost at the end of our uh, session. There are quite a few books piled up for those who want to read them. Any closing comments by any of you before you? Oh, good. Sure. <laughs> Come to Bhutan yeah. Yeah. soon. Go to Sikkim. <laughs> Don't go to Masuri. <laughs> okay, so I hope all of you are inspired to visit some of these uh, Himalayan retreats, though some of the, the conversations may have been a turn off rather than a turn on. But <laughs> thank you very much for being a most attentive and enthusiastic audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>